Bob Lachance, man, fellow hockey player, fellow multiplier or current multiplier. Uh, dude, I'm so excited to have you on the show and share your journey as an entrepreneur with my listeners. Uh, we just got off a vacation together in Mexico like three and a half weeks ago. So we got to actually connect in person. And um, dude, I- I'm just so excited for this interview. How are you doing today? Fun time, my man. Fun time. It's great to see you again. Last time we were in person, I had a, had a couple cervezas. So it was actually a really good time. That was a good time. We, we actually met after we did a deal together in Stanford. Yep. So we, yep. we did a deal together and then we met in person to celebrate that. And uh, it was awesome to get to know you more in depth uh, on vacation in Tulum, Mexico and all places. So uh, it's the always cool. bad. That place is not too bad, is it? Dude, I'll tell you what, that was a good time. I wish it was a little bit longer. Actually, it was like four days. We could have probably had that be seven days and it would have been oh, a, without a doubt. Without it would, it would have been nice. Yeah. So so people who aren't familiar with you, I mean, you actually have a really interesting background, a little similar to mine. You went a little bit farther than me in the hockey journey. So yep. tell everyone like your hockey journey real quick and, and, and how you kind of got to, to being an entrepreneur. Uh, you've been in the game for a while. So let's, let's talk about that first. Yeah, we're going way back now. We're going way back. Maybe the uh, gray beard is kind of throwing me off the two spots. Every time you get over a certain age, you get two, two gray spots right on your chin. But hey, um, uh, and I started investing back in 2004. Like you said, prior to that, I played hockey. Uh, I played went to Boston University for four years. Um, was fortunate enough to win a national championship, which is pretty cool. That's so sick. Uh, yeah, I got drafted by St. Louis, uh, St. Louis Blues. Signed with them on a two-year contract. Uh, it was a two-way contract, which you're, you're aware of. Um, so I played for, it's kind of like the AAA of the NHL, right? It's one level under the NHL. Played one exhibition game. Dude, I got a, I got a point a game in the NHL, though. That's so sick, game. man. That's, That's it. it. <laughs> so uh, I played, uh, let's go, four years here in the U.S. and then four years in Europe. So it's a pretty, pretty cool journey. Um, but towards, towards the end, just like, I mean, you probably went through the same thing, right? You, you got to figure out what the next step is after playing a sport, playing hockey. And uh, when you're in a hockey locker room for that many years, you kind you don't have the same network that, um, you know, you have when you're out and about here in the United States. So I was stuck in Europe for four years and, um, you know, you find out pretty quick. You're like, oh, shit. Like, what did could you swear on this podcast? Oh, dude, absolutely. Right, cool. There you go. All right, cool. All right perfect. All right, I just want to make sure. So, uh, you know, you, you find out pretty quick, man, it's, it's you need a network in this business um, or in any type of business. And, and having people that, um, you know, do something that you want to do is extremely important. So I had to figure out what I was going to do. Uh, so I started reading, reading books. Um, obviously, probably 90 percent of the people that listen to your podcast have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right. Um, and then I bought a course. Uh, David Wisnett, I think, is an attorney. Um, but of course, it was all about real estate, but all about, you know, nothing, you know, it wasn't, it didn't go deep in anything, but it taught concepts and ideas and all that kind of crap. Um, so I ended up bought it and it was an incredible course. So I just learned a bunch of stuff. Um, I learned what farming areas was. So I just jumped in my car. This is right when I retired, I need to find something. So I jumped in the cars, um, jumped in my car, drove neighborhoods. I looked for, you know, any sign, any beat up property, any, you know, windows broken, all that kind of crap that everyone learns. Um, so I called on a, a property, it was a listed property, it was back in 2004. Um, I got in for a showing, it was listed at 185, put an offer in at 135. And, you know, they got a call back from the agent that, and the seller accepted it. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm thinking a couple of things. This is before I even knew what I, what I knew. And I'm like, ah, oh, crap. That means I, I offered too high. I have to buy it. First, yeah, 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 right. They always say that. That's so funny. But my second thought was like, dude, where the hell am I going to find the money? Where am I going to find contractors? Like, I just came from the hockey rink and I, I just, you know, stuck a, a flag in the ground that said I was a rehabber. I didn't know shit. Like, I didn't know anything, right? But one thing I did know is I was going to figure it out. So I picked up a, uh, it's called uh, the Trader Magazine in, in a town. And I went through and I called three to four contractors. Um, one of them showed up guess who got the job the that first one. guy yeah, yeah the one that showed up his name was junior <laughs> he was actually phenomenal um called the mortgage broker found money i had a little of my own money put away as well but ended up making 32 grand on that deal and then uh fast forward i'm like you know i look in the mirror and i'm like jesus you know it took took two months to do that uh, made some pretty good money but i had no systems i had no marketing like it was all just me running and this is way before dude like we had cold calling, text messages. This is 2004, right? Yeah. So it was ancient. Me in the car. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's ancient. It's so, uh, yeah. 
It was actually pretty funny. And uh, I joined my local real estate association. I don't know if you know Pat Precourt. You know Pat? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good guy. So, so uh, there was a presenter. I'll get to Pat in a second. There's a presenter, um, Jeff Collar. He was uh, selling short sale courses, pre foreclosure courses. And uh, at that time, I was going to buy anything. I was a buyer. So I figured, you know what? Any education I can get um, outside of school, I'm going to take. Right. But in school, I didn't really show up to school, but now I'm in the uh, working world. So I'm, I have no choice but to get educated. So I uh, bought a short sale course and all of a sudden I went from being a rehabber to a short sale person. So in the next event, I actually uh, looked around and I, I asked um, probably about 10 people, who's the best in Connecticut in short sales? And they all pointed to Pat Precourt. So I walked up and I'm like, Pat, dude, you got no idea who I am. I don't know if you're looking to hire. I'm not looking for a, a, a paid job. I'll do anything. You got any openings? And he's like, you know what? I'm actually looking for a door knocker. And I'm like, oh boy. All right. Yeah. I'm like, all right. So he gives me a script. He gives me a bunch of pre foreclosure names. And I door knock from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., Monday through Friday. When I would get home, like I would literally knock on their door. If they weren't, they didn't answer, I would give them a lead behind. And I would also skip trace. And this is back in the day, 411.com was really the main thing he used. So I'd skip tracing them and I'd just call until like seven, eight o'clock at night. So that's how I got started the first year. And then uh, Pat and I became business partners, did well over a thousand short sale transactions, um, started a couple of education programs. Uh, one of them being one of the biggest, well, pre-COVID, one of the biggest uh, fortune builders was one of them. Um, Pat and I were running the back end of the coaching program while, um, you know, Dan, Paul and Conrad were out there uh, creating systems, processes, courses, and selling on stage. Um, and we were responsible for taking care of the back end of the coaching program. So investing, coaching at the same time. Fast forward, um, geez, bubble hit. Fast What's the short forward. sale real quick for listeners who are just, just to, to, to jump in real quick. What is it, if people aren't familiar with the short sale, what is a short sale? Because that, that's still a good strategy today if you get the right Absolutely. deal. It's something that's going to be coming down to the, Coming yes. in the future, because what it is, it's when a property is over debted and you can't buy it. So as an example, property is worth $150,000. The debt is worth 200. The debt on, yeah. on the property, I should say, is worth is, is at 200. You got to negotiate it down underneath that 150 to be able to make money. So okay. it's any property that's over debted. Um, so, okay. yeah, there's a whole strategy. And if I talk too fast, you could rein me back in. Um, there's a whole strategy that we actually set up. I created a, it's called the short sale flagship system back in the day. So it was, I think it was three or four binders on each department in a short sale business. Um, and I actually sold that on stage. I forgot to tell you, uh, created that system and sold that on stage as well at uh, different radio groups and on stage with, with uh, some of the, the bigger event guys. Um, and then uh, now we're in, geez, we're in 2007, fast forward 2008, 2009. Crash hits. Uh, it's a good thing we're in short sales because we understand the game. Oh yeah. And then, uh, yep. And then through all the fortune builders connections and all the coaching, I was always like one of the main things. Um, I'm more of a. It's kind of in hockey. I was an assist guy, right? I didn't give a shit if I scored goals, but um, you know, my mindset was more assists you get, the more goals you guys get, you win games, right? So it's kind of the same thing in business. It's it's. Uh, I was always looking for a product or a service for the students because. Students that come in, they either work part-time or majority of them work part-time or full-time and they want to do real estate as a side gig until they could get up and running and, you know, kind of get over that brink, if you will. So um, I got introduced 2013 to what a virtual assistant company is. And, Interesting. Yeah. And I had no idea what to do that. Like it, it was, it was very um, prevalent in like more on the real estate agent side rather than the investor side, because there's no one out there um, until kind of, we both, we broke the mold. So started my first company, virtual assistant company, 2014. Um, and I had a business partner at that time who, uh, who would go back and forth to the, to the Philippines. Cause he actually had a, uh, he was using virtual assistants and I brought him on stage to do a presentation in a mastermind that I was running. And, uh, when he got off stage, I was like, dude, we got a business. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I talking about? I got a handle of vodka, Tito's vodka, and I got a 30 pack in the room. I'll map out the business for you. So this is back in my room. We ended up mapping out the business, started in 2014. Um, and then in 2018, we split up. And now we have a very, very successful, my own, it's called Riva Global. Um, that's my virtual assistant company today. 
And we also have a real estate investment company. We closed over 150 transactions last year and we'll probably do two north of 200 this year. That's amazing, man. I, we got so much to talk about. I love it. I love yeah. the backstory. You did a great job, you know, just kind of tying everything together. So real quick, you know, virtual assistants are, are very popular now, but like you said, back in the day, it was kind of like, uh, you know, no man's land. No one was really using them. So for people who once again, aren't familiar with a virtual assistant or a VA, whatever you want to call them, what, what, how do you, how do you define a virtual assistant? Especially you have a massive VA company now. So what, what's your definition of a virtual assistant? Just so the so listeners. A vir a vir yeah. A virtual assistant is someone who doesn't work in your office. They could be American virtual assistants. They could be. So all my virtual assistants are out of the Philippines. So it's anybody who does not work in your office is really coined a virtual assistant in essence. And people kind of change names, but just, just picture this. You and I, um, you want to you wanna hire a virtual staff, right? You, yeah. you, you, let's say you work out of your office or you work out of your house. I do. And yeah. you, don't have, you, know, you don't have the big office to bring people in. So you need to hire somebody that does not work underneath your umbrella or does not work in your office. And majority of the time they are 1099 too. So they're not your right. employee, they're 1099. So it's somebody that wants to work full-time or part-time for you. And it's a 1099. So they'll do any, anything from admin work to transaction coordinating, to cold calling, to text messaging, to uh, you know, making offers, to marketing property management tasks, the whole nine yards. Anything that takes up and eats up your time is something that it's very good to outsource, right? Clients come to us all the time. They say, Bob, um, I either want to become more efficient I either want to scale or I want my time back. Mm -hmm. That's typically why people, you know, work with virtual assistants or work with my company. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And th that's a great way to define it because I always say that a virtual assistant or a virtual employee, as long as they physically don't need to go to a property, they can pretty much do anything, right? Yeah. And it's amazing, especially now with the way technologies evolved, there's virtual assistants. They're doing literally everything except for going to the property, you know, and, yep. and, and they're very good and they know what they're doing. And the better you train them, obviously that's a big key to your company is you guys train them in real estate specific strategies and, and activities. So, you know, a lot of these business owners are able to get, you know, 85% of the daily activities outsourced, right. To a virtual assistant to follow a process. And then the 15% that that's the, you know, you have to physically go to, you know, they have other people, contractors, acquisitions, managers, et cetera. And it's a great way to, to, like you said, scale and especially scale in a reasonable uh, tone to where you're not paying a virtual assistant 100K a year. You're not paying them 75K a year. You can get them at a very uh, reasonable price uh, and they can do a lot of work, you know, for you. And it's yeah, fulfilling. That's a good point. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I mean, we have we have a real estate side and a medical side. And you, you look at you look at um, real estate investors, you look at medical offices, different businesses, but they need the same thing done, meaning they need to lower the cost, lower the overhead. I mean, you know, all of us, you know, we, we are small business owners in real estate investing. We are, unless you're a big developer, you're right. But majority of us, probably people that are listening to your podcast are small business owners and everybody has to look at what their bottom line is. You know, what's their profitability, how much money's going out, right? How much money's coming in? It's always the juggle with uh, real estate investors. But 100%. once you actually start systemizing your business, then you can start looking at it saying, huh, I don't want to cold call anymore. Well, let me outsource that. Or I don't want to do upfront lead generation. Let me outsource that. Why am I going to be doing TC work, right? Transaction coordinating work. Why don't I hire a virtual assistant to be managing the process from talking to an attorney to talking to a mortgage company to talking to agents? Why don't they do that? Um, we have a lot of clients that are property managers, right? They oh, it's huge, lease, huge. Yeah, leases, lease renewals, um, maintenance mainline, calls. They call in, dude. Like you don't want. I mean, think about that. Properties you own. Do you want to take the headache calls from a from a tenant that says, "Oh, well, uh, little Johnny was hanging on a on a cabinet door." Like, who the hell does? I have three kids. My kids never hung on a cabinet door. But why does it always happen on a rental property? I don't know. Do you want to take those calls? I don't. You know, no. as an example, right? So. I love that. I call it conducting traffic with rentals. It's like, <laughs> as long even dude, Sherrod in our group says the same thing. He's got like 60 properties and he's like, even if the property burns down, they shouldn't even call me because there's nothing I can even do about that. Like you right. call in, think hopefully no one's injured and it'll get rebuilt. But it's like, you know, 
I can't add any value if the property is burning down. Like I'm not a firefighter, you know what I mean? So it's like, at the end of the day, you can have a VA do pretty much all the work and you can manage the VA. And I, I've always found this, like I have employees, you have employees, you have many employees. If you train them right and systematize it and make it, like I say, you got to make it as simple to where a three-year-old can do it. And then that three-year-old can explain to the other three-year-old exactly how to do it. And that's when you know you have a good system in place and you can follow a process on, uh, on like a screen share, for example, like Loom, and you can do something once. And even if you have to swap out employees, that content you made is an asset in your company and it's part of your systems. And I've found that hiring people, like I have everything already kind of mapped out. So if I need to bring someone else on, they already have a system to get plugged into. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta create the training I and mean, that's, that's exactly what we do in our company, right? We create, we have pre pre-trained virtual assistants, obviously for your business. And you know, you look at real estate, you could do anything from, you know, you're an Airbnb, you're fix and flip, you're a wholesaler, right? You're, you're buy and hold investor, you're a property manager, you're a real estate agent, right? I mean, they, they, it goes wider and wider and wider every day. Once you coin a new strategy or new, yeah, whatever right. you want to you coin it at that day, but, um, you know, outsourcing what we, what we do in the tasks, I was going to touch upon this when you, when you, uh, you actually hit on a good point. As real estate investors, as as entrepreneurs, you want to limit the negativity in, in, in the stuff that we get beat on all day long, right? So, and what I mean by that is if you're taking a tenant call and just people bitching on a daily basis, that affects you. It does. I don't care what anybody it's says. It's, it just sucks your energy right out of you. And those are the things that, you know, uh, virtual assistants do a really good job. Like I said, when I first started, I door knocked, right? I door knocked every Monday through Friday. That was tiring. That beat you up, right? But it was the best thing I ever did. And then I cold called. That beat you up too. Cold calling and doing the initial call on a on a kind of a cold lead beats the crap out of you. However, I do recommend you do it. The way we have it set up in our office is I have all our virtual assistants cold calling all day long, all day long, all day long. As soon as someone raises their hand that says yes. I'll entertain an offer that goes over to my acquisition team who's sitting right behind this wall. could probably hear everything I'm saying right now. And those are leads right there that are already pre-screened. And then it's their job to turn that into money. I do recommend, and I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but you know, I've heard other people be like, oh, hire a virtual assistant to close your deals. You're an absolute idiot if you do that. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying- Yeah, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. I've tried it. Trust me. I've tried. I own a company that's a virtual assistant company. It doesn't work. It doesn't. <laughs> work. So use them to drive. If we're just talking about that side of it, use them to drive in leads, right? Text messaging, cold calling, just gauging the motivation. Then boom, you got to, you got to hand them off to your team. Totally. And the best part about that is that when a virtual assistant passes that lead off and they gather the information, the salesperson in that scenario actually has a lead that they know the script, they, they know the skinny on, they know the address, right. why they're selling the condition, and then they can have an intelligent conversation to see if they're actually a fit to solve their problem versus them having to go and like go through the minutia of seeing if they're even a qualified lead. You can have a virtual assistant do, you know, 80% of the heavy lifting. And that 20% is why that salesperson has a job, quite frankly. And uh, they convert that into a contract. So you actually made a good point on, on the transition I want to make here on this podcast. Now you have this great VA company and it's awesome. But you also mentioned you did 150 deals last year, which is yep. ridiculous. I mean, a lot of people who have had on the show are not doing that type of volume. So obviously in order to do that type of volume, you have to have systems dialed in in order to achieve that result. So let's touch base on the marketing side of that, because that just the amount of marketing that you probably do to get those, that business is, is substantial. So what do you guys do from a high level marketing standpoint in order to get the type of traffic to, you know, ultimately get those results? Like what are your, or what are your favorite channels? Like, cause you're, you're in so, Connecticut, you do deals all over the place. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, we're doing, I think we're in, 15 different markets. That's not states. It's different markets, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts. We just did North Carolina, Ohio, uh, Arkansas, Georgia. I don't know if I said that right in Florida. Um, so okay. I could be East missing Coast. one. I got to. I got to ask Adam, my business partner, that's in the other room over there. Um, but our main marketing channels right now. Um, and here's one of the things that I did want to mention. Um, and you, you and I talked about this over a beer. There's a lot of people that have, that have service companies and businesses that don't do the business, right? Um, and I, I, 
I personally think that everybody who has a service company should be doing business in that industry, right? So 100%. if if you're gonna have a VA company and you're 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 selling um, or offering VAs for real estate, I would recommend that you do real estate because it's a way like you just have to do it because you know what works and what doesn't, right? I mean, yeah. it's like and then, like, even when I was um, selling a short sale course, right? We did over a thousand short sales, and we we're current. We we're doing short sales when I was selling it, like. I just need to be, I have to make sure I'm doing that business while you're actually, you have that service because I think it's, for me, it's way better credibility. And I can't stand in front of someone and tell them what to do when I never did it. Right. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, uh, an in-law that never owned a business trying to tell you how to run a business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Telling sense. you why it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Try to, you're trying to tell me why, yeah. Why uh, you should, uh, you should, you should be a wholesaler instead of a rehabber when they, they watched flip this house. Right. Sorry, unless you did something and you did it, it doesn't it doesn't work? But anyway, um, I know we're bouncing around a little bit. Where was I? What were we talking uh, about? The marketing, marketing to get the <laughs> deals. Get back to market. Yeah. All right. So what we do is we do cold calling, text messaging, and direct mail. That's the main thing okay. um, that we're doing. That's what got us last year 150 transactions, and now we're in. I don't know a month we're in. It's flying by this year, but um, we're our lead generation is still the same volume. Same we have. I think seven acquisition guys in the other office there, seven or eight. I think we're adding two more um, come next week. So, okay. So you got anyway, to, those, those are all the leads that come in. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, and I, I like those channels and a lot of people like to poo poo that type of stuff. And I'll tell you right now, we have 18 deals going on right now. And those properties are mainly from those three channels, right? Yeah. Just locked up a house in California, home run deal from cold calling. Right. So it's like, people always like shit on these like mail texting and calling. And I'm always like, well, you got to like take a step back here. Why are you shitting on that? It's probably because you're not doing it right. Because yep. the person who's shitting on that is usually selling something else that has nothing. No, I was to do just going to say that. It's yeah. because you're probably trying to sell something else. Yeah. I, mean, I, I can only tell you what I do, right? In, in, totally. in every market tweaks, is a, every market's a little different, right? You know that, right? One, yeah. one thing like direct mail may work great for you. In my market this month, it might not work good, but next month it will. It's the consist. So people, and this is one of the challenges. You and I talked about this. One of the challenges is people quit too easy, right? 100%. You you don't set the right budget. You'll you know you'll be like, oh, direct mail is the best, and I'll spend ten thousand dollars in one drop. I'm like, you shouldn't do that. You should send out twenty five hundred pieces of mail every Monday for two months, rather than a ten thousand dollar drop. Because guess what? You're gonna you're gonna get all calls within a one time you know one time, and then all of a sudden you're gonna be sitting there and be like, oh shit, now now I ran out of money. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. The consistent Dude. flow. It's like, it's, 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 but those are little things, you know, we've learned along the way, right? Not everyone's going to learn that stuff and understanding what that means is being consistent. A hundred percent, dude. And I always say sometimes, like sometimes you don't learn until you get stung a little bit. And I think everyone who's been in this business for more than a couple of years has made that mistake with calling, mailing, et cetera, gotten all those leads, their team gets bogged down or they get bogged down. And then like, wait a minute, if I actually just have these get dripped out over a couple months, we're going to get a steady flow of leads and we're going to have like the adequate systems to handle that, that type of business coming in. And then you can actually like scale, even though I say that with quotes, cause everyone fucking loves that word scale, oh, dude, I know. you know, and you're just like, all right, so what does that even mean? But so what's the, what is the definition? Of, like, what does that mean? Dude, that's a good question. Let's cover that. So I think in everyone talks, you know, if you're any, anyone here where Bob and I are in some high level masterminds with, you know, multiple seven figure owners and all that bullshit. And, you know, everyone usually has the same problem. They have a tough time scaling or they have a tough time hiring. And I, I, that's valid. I mean, I think everyone to an extent has that challenge, no matter how yep. successful they are. Doesn't matter what industry, dude. Doesn't matter what industry. Could be anything. I think the definition of scaling is being able to repeat your process to essentially uh, achieve like kind of like a unlimited amount of business within basically it's hard for me to kind of put like it's basically to like duplicate what you're doing in a high volume to where you can achieve bigger results with similar effort but usually the problem is that the systems break it's not the marketing or the sales process it's the systems behind that break and then people spend a lot of money and they go broke because they saw some dick face on facebook talk about how they made 300 grand in one month because they scaled. And then the other person tried to do it the wrong way and got fucked. Sit next, to his buddy's car, sit next to his buddy's car and he doesn't even own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. With the penis extension mechanism broken, you know, the Ferraris, there's a recall, all the penis extension mechanisms, you know, decided to not work. So ask me how I know, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I, that's how I look at scaling. It, it's like, cause you could scale any business, but it, it's really basically just repeating something you're already doing. That's working 
in a high volume to hopefully achieve way bigger multiples. Like if you're making 300 grand, how do you scale to make $3 million, which would be a 10 X on your yeah. bottom line. That's how I look at scaling. Um, but I mean, other people could have different definitions. Um, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? That's kind of how I look at it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I like to scale it, it. A lot of times it's a buzzword. Like you said, when you're trying to sell something, right. It is, it's a good buzzword because everyone wants to scale. Um, yeah. I can, I can yeah. use our, I'll use my office, my real estate office as an example. We started one salesperson, added another, added another. But one of the things that's really important, it's hiring is really important. So you mm -hmm. brought it up. You can't, nobody can scale unless they hire correctly. And I think this is a huge part of it. And bringing virtual assistants is part of that as well for, for us. I mean, our, our first lead channel was just cold call. Then we added text messaging. Then we added direct mail. I mean, I'm going way back. I was door knocking, of course, right? Yeah. But I'm just saying within my office, it was cold calling because I'm using my own virtual assistants, text messaging. I'm using my own team, right? Direct mail. They're taking the calls, inbound calls. So I'm using my own team, right? We also do some, I did forget this one because we all in the state of Connecticut, we, uh, you may know this, but we scrape all of our uh, pre-foreclosure leads. Yeah. It's good state. We started that. this about three weeks ago. Cool little process. Scraping all the leads, get them to skip trace. They're calling and texting them to see if they're, you know, if they have a sale date set, foreclosure sale date set. So we're doing this campaign. I'll let you know next time I'm on um, how that process is going. So um, it works. Actually, yeah. Oh, I've done it. I did, I did this yeah. pre COVID and then we just stopped it. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, when they put a moratorium on that, you know, let everyone it fucked it. everything up. That yeah. works. Qu quick story on that. So I, I had that idea a couple of years ago and I, I actually wanted to prove the model before I scaled it. And uh, I ran into this fucking house and the lady, I, I'll never, I'll never forget this. I always say this story all the time. I'll never forget this, this fucking deal. I, I remember looking at this lead and I was like, holy shit, this thing is a fucking home run because it's in a neighborhood that is one of the most desirable in, in one of the most desirable towns in uh, New York where I, uh, where I'm from. And I said, holy shit, this lady only owes one fucking 30 and this house is worth 300. This is a, cause usually like they're upside down or whatever, oh, yeah, yeah. they'll make yeah. us work. I said, holy shit, this is a fucking, and the owner wasn't, the owner was deceased and it had some distress with it. So I, I actually personally called the fucking seller. I said, Hey, um, I'm Greg. You don't know me from a hole in the wall. I was interested in making you an offer on your house. You know, don't know if you want to sell or not. She said she doesn't want to sell. And normally most people will say, okay, no problem. And something was telling me, I don't know, a little bell was going off my head. And it was like, <laughs> you know what? Just try to get in the door, literally. And I said, no problem. That's no big deal. Quick question. Is it all right if I at least come over and I can take a look at the property and I'm not going to force you to sell to me. I just want to be able to help you be a trusted advisor. And by the end of the meeting, you'll know exactly what the property is worth. And if I can help you, I'll tell you exactly how I can do that. And she's like, that sounds fair. So I remember going to this house. I actually, I don't go on appointments anymore, but I went on this appointment. Two hours later, she's one of the most motivated sellers I've ever seen, bought the house, made a lot of money, truly helped the lady, like literally truly helped her because she was fucked. And uh, that was a seller who told me they didn't want to sell their house from the pre-foreclosure system. So look and, at that. And a great takeaway there, though, is a lot of times you don't realize that there's motivation. This is why proper sales training is very important. You have to peel back the layers when someone yes. tells you no at the beginning. It's not an, it, it's, it's how they answer that. It's how you got to at it's in the questions. There's so much to it. And that's why I highly recommend it. You probably talk about that all the time, but man, it's, you know, not every, so here's what, I, this is what I love about this business, right? You could have a highly trained uh, salesperson right here. Yeah. You could have a not highly trained salesperson here. They'll both get the same lead. This dude will say, these leads suck. This dude will say, these leads are gold. Right. So you got to look at it. It's the beauty of marketing. Right. I mean, dude, we got like the leads that come in our office. If our guys are not trained the right way, they're going to be like, oh, these leads suck. I'm like, it's not the fucking leads, bro. Not the, it leads. Ain't the leads. Why don't you implement the thousand dollars a month sales training that we, you know, it's just it's not the leads. It's 100 percent process them. Is important. I, so true, dude. It's so true, especially too. I've noticed, like in in our area, like Connecticut, New York, and California, where I live, like a lot of these like motivated sellers. Like we don't do business with we do business with reasonable sellers. Like the people that sell me houses or sell our team houses. Listen, there's a reason they're selling. They're not selling just because they're curious. But like these people are pretty savvy. Usually they're not like ultra ultra distressed. Sometimes they are. 
but usually they're selling for convenience sake. They are aware of what's going on. Like they understand that we're there to make a profit and to help them. And like a lot of the gurus who don't do the business, like you said earlier, make it seem like you got to find someone who's about to jump off a cliff if they don't sell their house. And I tell right. people all the time, I'm like, that those people don't really like, we really don't buy from them. We buy from people who are reasonable and they're like, they're smart. Like I bought a house off a millionaire in California. He lived on fucking Catalina Island and he sold me his house at a discount. And I'm like, he wasn't distressed and I made 40 grand. And I'm like, like if that guy was a distressed seller, I would have threw that lead out. Right. But I'm like, no, this is a smoking deal. So like a lot of it is like, like you said, having good training, making sure your salespeople follow a process and then being able to just have a good conversation with a seller, like a reasonable conversation, like a human to human conversation, not like this crazy fucking voodoo bullshit. Well, and, and, you know? and that's another point. That's another point. An important part that a lot of people miss um, is you got to have a follow up system. I know it sounds so, some people use it as cliche, but dude, like I think it's, I don't know how many of those 150 properties last year we closed on. I don't think one of them was a one closed call, not one of them. So never, it's never a one call uh, close call. So never. it's all follow up. You're, you're touching them anywhere. I don't know my exact average, but you're probably six to 10 times, right? On average. If not more. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. So. It, it, you know, the reason is because like people, you know, this is where like the investors goals and the seller's goals are normally not aligned right off the bat. It's like, okay, the investor wants to make money today and get paid on Friday, right? Today's Monday, Friday's in four days from now. The seller might want to sell a house at a discount, but they're not probably going to want to sell their house at a discount on Friday. So like I found like, especially like, um, I'll give you actually an example, the one we did in Connecticut, uh, in Stanford, the lady, she was motivated. She was a motivated seller. She lived in Arkansas, ironically. I know you guys do deals down there. And did, the house did, we, did, did you tell the story that we did a deal here? And uh, I think it was before we got on, we got on camera. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'll talk, I'll talk about it now. So the, this actually will drive the, the point home that we're speaking about. So this lady calls up, speaks to my assistant. My assistant goes, yo, this is a fucking good lead. This is hot. Like you should get on this right now. So my, me and my acquisition, I was still training my acquisitions guy. So I'm like, let's just fucking sniff it out here. She's got a house for sale. So we have like a system in our, this is like a whole, well, this is a bonus part of our podcast. So we have a six step system in our company. There's, there's six boxes that make up a deal, right? In order for someone in our company to be a lead, they got to check two. If they're, if they check three, they're a qualified lead and you know, the more, the better, right? So they got to have a reason for selling. The house needs to need some sort of updates or it's a total shithole. Uh, they have to have a specific timeline. Usually it's six months or less. Um, they, uh, they know they can get more if they can list it, but they don't want to list it for some reason. By the way, that's the best option. Um, it's vacant or there's a vacant unit. If it's a multi-building, um, that has made us a lot of money in California. And then the fifth one is their asking price is less than Zillow. That's mainly for New York and California because those markets are fucking bonkers. And if you get a deal below Zillow, usually you're making money. So in our company, they got to check at least two out of six boxes to be elite. This lady checked like five and vacant reason for selling timeline needs updates, knows they can get more. But she was not a lay down. She had some other investors she's talking to. She had all this bullshit. And it was like, I think a four or five uh, call close. She ended up selling the property to us, even though she had another offer from someone else because she knew that we were serious. And she was smart. She, I think she worked for a big company. She was make, made a lot of money. She was not a moron whatsoever. She had an attorney. It was, you know, we had to get that involved. We ended up making like 32 grand on this deal that was uh, from a smart, intelligent seller because they were reasonable. They weren't ultra motivated, but they were reasonable and they didn't want to fuck with a house in Stanford when they were living down in Arkansas. We were able to solve her problem, but like to the typical set, like new investor, they'd be like, oh, she's not desperate, well, you know? You know, the, 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 funny, the funny part on that, so you you hooked up with my business partner, Adam. Right? Yeah, yep. So you guys hooked up, um, come to find out. So this is, this is the reason to have a big network as well, right? Yeah. You guys met up. I don't even know where the hell you guys met. Maybe it was- We connected group. online, Facebook group or some shit. Yeah. Connect, connected like, online. So yeah. we dispoed that, we dispoed the deal for you. We split the deal. Yep. And this is the beauty of it. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, we're hanging out in Tulum. I never met you personally prior to that. Exactly. It's, kinda, it's just how the world goes and how it's pretty interesting. And, and one of the other takeaways there is, you know what? Don't be greedy. Never use, use a network, right? There's always, there's a lot of money to be made together rather than just trying it by yourself. Like, think about this. Too many people look at it have such a, a, a fixed mindset to say, oh, well, why would I ever want a partner? I'm like, dude, why wouldn't you? So you could do 10 times more and make 10 times more money. Like, doesn't make any sense. Like, 
But a lot of newer investors, unfortunately, feel that way because they just don't understand until they're in the game for a little while. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And it's like, why, like, like here's the news. Here's, I like how you actually said that. So here's something that happens in our business a lot. We get a lot of deals through new wholesalers. I either buy the house from them or we JV it. And I always, this is my pitch to bring, this is a brand new, but not someone who's been around for a while. This is a brand investor. My pitch is this. You're most likely statistically speaking, going to make more money. If you split a deal with me 50, 50, than you would if you were trying to sell that to somebody else. And why is that? Because I've been around for five years. I have a humongous fucking list. I can close on it and I know what I'm doing. So I'll, I'll tell you if it's a deal or not. And not only are they going to make money with me, but they're also going to learn exactly why it's a deal and what makes it a deal versus them having to guess. You know, And a lot of new people, they eventually open up to that idea and they sell with me or to me. But in the beginning, they're like, well, I don't want to split it. It's my lead. Like, what, what do I want to split it for? I'm like, I'm not going to force you to do a deal with me, but like they just, like you said, they don't see it from a long term mindset. They see I, it. I, in, got, in, I, got, I got another funny story for you. Like, I love it. Let's fucking exactly, hear it. I love exactly it. Exactly what you just said. Um, we just closed the deal. We were talking about this before. Closed yeah. the deal, made $103,000. This is from a rehabber that was trying to break our balls about how much our assignment fee was. You know, what we say, fuck you. We're closing <laughs> on it. We're going to rehab it and resell it. So thank you very much. The dude that actually was trying to count how much money we're making as wholesalers, because we have enough money to be able to fund anything anyway. So the power of also having funding behind you is oh, saying, it's okay, huge. yeah, if you're trying to break my stones and, and, and you're telling me how much I'm going to make, this is not how the game goes. We have no. the pro wholesalers have the product, right? So if you have a rehabber come in and say, oh, you're making this much money, just go to the next buyer. We're in a time right now where you could actually just say, yeah, you're out next buyer, right? 100%. Because, and again, that may turn or that will turn in the future. But right now you're, we're at a different time where, you know what? Agents don't have any product, right? You, you see it online all the time with every on housing wire, right? Everybody says, oh, there's no product. There's no product. Well, how come the investors have the product, right? Because they're doing the damn work. Marketers and negotiating, like it, it's sales process once you have that dialed in you have the actual product so just be careful just my my words of advice don't ever have someone um tell you how much you're going to make oh my deal. gosh you know? dude i know this rehabber and he used to have this fucked up belief until he did some deals with me and he's actually helped me uh manage rehabs that i have and he used to have this belief where it was like, oh, if you're making more than $10,000, that's a little funny. And I, I actually like re I, I actually like broke that belief for him. I said, you know, why do you, what, what makes you think like, what, what makes that belief valid in your mind? And he just told me all these kind of reasons on why, like, it's not fair and you're not, you know, and I, I actually walked him through like how the fucking game works and like the value that a wholesaler will bring, assuming they're like a, a legit wholesaler, which most people are. And then he was like, yeah, that's actually true. And I said, if I gave you a deal and I made a million dollars, but then that deal totally worked for you. Like if you didn't know I was making a million dollars and you just thought I was making $1, you wouldn't give a shit, right? So you wouldn't care. And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, so the only thing that changed is the fact that I told you I made a million dollars. But if you didn't know that and you didn't count my money, you wouldn't have given a shit. So you're basically just basically thinking I'm getting something for nothing. And I basically broke the belief for him. And I'm like, it doesn't really matter as long as the number works through. Dude, if a wholesaler brought me a house and this happens in cat all the time and they made a hundred grand, I don't give a fuck. Right. Dude, the deal works. I don't care. Like whatever. It, good but, for you. But yeah. again, there are a lot of people. And also just keep in mind that some people do change. You're like, God, oh, Greg, just, I know he's probably making a hundred grand in the next deal. So then they'll try to cut you down. Oh yeah. 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 Like, that's what happened. So that's a good little watch out yeah. for the future bullshit they're going to be dealing with, right? Totally, dude. Totally, man. So as we wrap the show up, uh, you know, uh, we talked about the acquisitions, how you guys are getting these houses. What are you guys doing on the dispo side, especially because you're, you're selling properties in, in, in 15 different metro areas? So obviously, um, that's a lot of work, quite frankly. That's a lot of fucking moving parts. So what are you guys doing to make sure you're selling your wholesale deals to the right buyers for the right price? Yeah. So we actually use, we just, I can't say we just, we've probably been signed up with investor lift for about six months, maybe. Um, okay. So that's been working very well. We also have a very big buyer. So it's obviously through investor lift. Um, yeah. Also we have our guys are on the phones, just hammering phones. You find out what a local buyer is and, and a lot, what we've, we've been doing is kind of reverse wholesaling. Um, 
we were selling to a lot of hedge funds. Um, but keep in mind, if you start selling to hedge funds, they, they move the goalposts a lot, right? Literally, you'll have five deals getting ready to close. All of a sudden, they'll pull up some bullshit inspection, you know, inspection report, and they want X amount of money off. Just know that stuff happens, but it's part of the game. It is what it is. Um, so what we're, we're doing a good, good job of is we target, you know, kind of the smaller private equity companies right now that know they want to buy in volume. So you find some of those, and it doesn't have to be this. I'm just telling you what we do in a lot of these little markets. So you got to find the buyers first. We do, I, I think someone coined it reverse wholesaling, but finding the buyers first and then going into that market, but you got to mm -hmm. make sure you vet those buyers and make sure they're good, right? And it's just like your own backyard, dude. Like if you know who the buyers are, it just makes it that much easier to make money in wholesaling. Because you already have an exit, you know, like, you know, before you lock it up that, that Rick Jones will pay 300 for it. You have it for 240, you know, you're making 60 grand, right? And because you know that he buys it for three, he sells it for four and a quarter. He doesn't give a fuck if he makes his $30,000 profit. And the yeah. type of buyer and the type of buyer you want that typically pays higher is someone that's not a rehabber, right? That is true. Obviously, obviously if the, yeah. if the uh, properties beat the shit, right, that's one thing you got to sell it to a rehabber, but individuals that you know, whether it's a, a property management company that represents buy and hold investors, as an example, a hedge fund or someone that's Airbnb, right? You can typically pay a little bit more if the property can, if the condition of property is a little bit better. If it's beat up, then, you know, obviously you got to go the, the uh, rehab route. A hundred percent. So with InvestorLift, if people aren't familiar with that, I'll tell them what it is. And then I got a follow-up question on that and then we'll wrap the show up. So InvestorLift, for people who don't know, is basically a software that allows you to nationwide find all the top buyers pretty much with a click of a button. Exactly. It's, it's, a, it's, a dispo, it's a dispo tool. The dispo tool. Are you guys putting those things on the marketplace or are you just pulling the list of buyers near that subject property and just fucking blowing them up with calls and emails? We, we do both. We you do both. both. Okay. And yeah. you see a difference? Like, do you see most of them go from the direct or most of them go from I don't the have enough data really to be honest. Yeah. I don't have enough data, um, but I know, you know, some of the people that actually have more data than I do on it um, say to do both. Yeah. You know, and it, make it, sure you have it, pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another tip for investors. I'll just, just drop this in real quick. So here's another, if you don't want to buy investor or whatever, here's something that I've done in a market that I don't know shit about and it worked. So a lot of markets in the country, fortunately now have Redfin, which is in my opinion is like Zillow on steroids for a free software. Okay. So if you go into Redfin and you actually find out, and this has worked very well, you go and you find out all the fixers that sell. And you, instead of calling the buyers direct, you can go to the buyers if you want. But I found that if you incentivize a realtor, they're going to bring you more buyers even more and you pay them a little commission. I was, I was actually going to say yeah. the same, same exact Fucking thing. call the listing agent up. Hey, I got this fixer. I saw your client paid X for it. I got this thing for Y. They'll do all the damn work for you. You pay them $2,000, you make you $30,000 and they're happy as a fucking clam. And that is, that is dude, that's, you, you freaking nailed it. That's hundred. Yeah. And, and a lot of people just, you know, think about this. You have an agent that's starving for properties. They starving. Can't find starving. Starving. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a great, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things I was going to bring up, but very, very important. And that's, that's all you have to do is pick up the phone and call them, dude. That's it. Exactly. Right. And they do all the work for you. And they have those repeat buyers. Like, and they have, like, they have buyers that you didn't even know about. And like, they're just like, holy shit, you just brought me this deal. Like, they, 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 the, the negotiate, like, whatever they make is, is irrelevant. Like, I had a guy in California bring me a buyer. I paid him five grand. I made 70 and he didn't get, he knew, he knew what was going on. He didn't give a fuck. Cause he literally got a phone call from me and he made five grand. Right. So it's like work with realtors. If you're a wholesaler here, because they're going to bring you a lot of value. If you know how to communicate with them, because your incentives are the same to get a deal closed. That's it. That's the objective is to close a deal. Right. So that's how they're getting paid. That's how you're getting paid. That's how the buyer gets the property. So there's just so many ways to skin the cat now with technology. And if you, you know, VAs do this too, you can have VAs screen lists and all that stuff. So Bob, I know we can talk for three fucking hours. Obviously we won't do that on today's show. We'll save that for part two in Mexico. So this has been a lot of fun. If people want to connect with you, man, they want to check out your, your VA company, or they just want to check out your real estate company or follow you personally. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you, man? Yeah, just check out Reva Global, R-E-V-A global.com. That's my virtual assistant company. I think we're at over, I think we're about eight, almost 800 VAs nationwide. Amazing. Um, so it's growing every day. It's going really well. Obviously the, the times, uh, the time is perfect. Obviously to outsource um, our real estate investment company is called Perch Rock Management, uh, perchrockmanagement.com. Check us out there. You can check us out um, on Facebook. Um, you know, just friend me on Facebook. Uh, check out Reva Global Perch Rock Management myself. And uh, I think that's about it. That's about it. Awesome. Bro. 
we'll make sure we got all that in the show notes, dude. This was a fun episode, and I'm uh, looking forward to the, uh, the world to hear this in a couple weeks. All right, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Likewise. Take care, Bob.